All right. Well, why don't I kick it off? Uh, obviously, we're, we're really excited to have uh, Leonard Dick with us today. He's an award-winning television writer and producer of several hit shows, including The Good Wife, The Mentalist, House and Lost. Um, I love to say this. Not only is he one of the great minds behind some of these really amazing shows, but he's also a Torontonian. He's a Harvard grad and a former Wall Street analyst. So he has a ton of rich material to draw inspiration from. So Leonard's presentation is titled The History of Television in Five Shows. It's a view of the changing media landscape from the quote unquote creative front line. So we're really excited to hear more. Uh, Leonard, thank you so much for doing this. And we look forward to uh, hearing your presentation. Thanks, Kenrick. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm thrilled to be with the, I hope everybody is, is north of the border. I miss you all. Uh, I don't miss the weather, but I, I miss being home. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to be doing this. And as Kenrick said, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the television business has been changing and you all read it in the, the Globe and Mail, ROB, or the Wall Street Journal. But I thought it might be interesting for you to hear from Boots on the Ground, somebody who's on the creative front lines. And just to give you a little bit of uh, insight into what I do, I am a television writer-producer. You know, it, it's hyphenated writer-producer. And what TV writer-producers do is a little different from, I contrast it with the movie business. Um, in the movie business, uh, the movie business has historically been a actor and director driven medium. So let's say you have a script called the Kenrick Sylvester story. Okay, nobody's making that. No one's gonna pay 15 bucks to see that. <laughs> However, if Leonardo DiCaprio wants to star in it and Patty Jenkins or, or Patty Jenkins wants to direct that and preferably both, then every studio is gonna line up and, and throw $100 million to make that movie and another $50 million to market that movie. Um, but that, so that is the movie business. Director, historically a director and actor driven medium. And now it is actually shifting a little bit to franchise uh, driven a la Marvel and the like. We'll talk about th that later on. The television scripted business has historically been a writer driven medium. Everything begins with the writer um, and the writer creates the show and becomes what is called the showrunner. He or she runs the show. So names you may recognize, Shonda Rhimes, who created Bridgerton and Grey's Anatomy, uh, Ryan Murphy, who's on American Horror Story and The Trial of O.J. Simpson and, and, and Glee. Everything begins with um, the, the, the writer-producer, the, the, the showrunner, and a, and a show will have a team of writer-producers. We, we work on the, all the episodes together. We, uh, you know, you, I might write an individual script. If I'm on the staff of a show, I might write an individual script, but, and I'll also produce that, that episode. But so I am known as what is a writer producer. Sometimes I will work on the staff of a show. I am trying to set up some of my own shows. And so it's very much a, a boots on the ground. And as Kenrick alluded to, and this is no surprise, there have been seismic changes in our industry in, in the last few years. Uh, and things that, that you, know, you know and that you don't know. Viewing habits, the way people watch shows, the way my aunt, my 87-year-old aunt watches TV is very different from how she watched it five, five years ago. Uh, we all know about cord cutters. And now there's a new, I don't know if anyone's heard this term yet, the cord nevers. That's the younger generation, people who wouldn't even think of getting Rogers or, or, or satellite. It's just not on their radar. Then you have these mega mergers in the last few years. Uh, AT&T buying Time Warner, and then three years later, waking up and deciding they don't want to be in the media business anymore and selling it to Discovery. And then you have what I think is one of the watershed uh, moments in, in the entertainment industry is Rupert Murdoch selling the, most of the assets of Fox to Disney and Disney becoming this uh, e enormous colossus of it, even bigger than it was before. Then you have factors like the agencies that are now owned by these private equity firms or uh, Endeavor, which is the parent company of WME, which is my agency, is now a publicly traded company. And, and so, and then they're also branching into production and the like. And then you have the end of what's called packaging that the agencies no, can no longer package shows and make all these enormous fees. And all of this happened before COVID. And then COVID both accelerated and exacerbated some of these changes. And it's been just this head spinning series of events and everybody is trying to, to get their footing. So with that, I'm going to give you a little presentation and I'm very proud that I can do this with PowerPoint. Uh, I'm probably one of the few people in my profession know, knows how to use it. So I put this in a PowerPoint presentation. I'm gonna share my screen and uh, forgive me for any glitches because I'm not a regular at this. So hold on, first of all, let me get rid of my text so no one can see my friends criticizing me. Okay, so hold on, okay. 
Okay, Kenrick, we see that? Okay, great. Um, so I am going to begin um, this uh, with a, uh, a personal, a little personal uh, anecdote here. So last year um, I was hired to run season two of The Right Stuff, which was a series that was on uh, Disney Plus. Uh, it, it's, it's a bit of a long complicated story, but it was originally developed for the Nat Geo uh, network, uh, which was a cable network and Nat Geo was eventually uh, it was part of Fox at the time. It was owned, it was sold to Disney, and so the show be was then uh, redirected to the Disney Plus streaming service. And um, the show is based on the Tom Wolf book uh, about the origins of the astronaut program, the Mercury Project story. Some of you may be familiar with the movie that was made. I think it was in 1981. Is the movie that put Sam Shepard, Dennis Quaid, Ed Harris on the map. But this, was this uh, show was based uh, on the original material, source material from the Tom Wolfe book. And uh, hold on, let me get this right. Okay, and the studio uh, was Warner Brothers, which uh, controlled the rights to the right stuff. And the network, as I said, was Disney Plus. And also as part of the auspices of the show, uh, we had the executive producers were some high profile uh, people, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's company, Appian Way, um, they were uh, they they were actually the ones who got the rights to the Tom Wolf book directly from Tom Wolf before he died, and uh, were able and negotiated with Warner Brothers. They bought it, they developed it, and sold it. And also another executive producer on the show was Danny Strong, who created um, who co-created uh, Empire and wrote uh, the Butler Lee, the da Lee Daniels movie, and more and most recently did uh, the limited series. Dope Sick. Uh, if you haven't seen Dope Sick, I highly recommend it. It's about the opioid crisis. So we had some very, uh, some very big names uh, associated with the show. And so um, I was hired to run season two. Uh, season one had a, a bit of a bumpy ride for a variety of reasons. And so I was brought in uh, to take over the show. And we started working on the show, mapping out a game plan for season two, coming up with the stories. And while we were doing this process, uh, going through this process, one of my producing partners, um, uh, mention this, and this is a quote that uh, was, is going to be a centerpiece to this little presentation. Whoops, hold on. Okay, what she said was, is that Disney wants to see a few weeks of data before deciding on a pickup. We, were, we started to work around September. Uh, the show was going to launch in November. And so we, were, we didn't get our official, they didn't want to give us our official pickup until they saw a few weeks of data. And so Keep, I'm going to come back to the statement because it is actually very layered and very relevant to some of the things I'm going to be talking about. Um, so with that, as, I, uh, as we said, we're going to, I'm going to talk about the history of TV in five shows. And all these five shows represent what I think are inflection points. And uh, I will say this up front, a little bit of a disclaimer, which is the, this is all opinion. You know, you could talk to anybody and say, well, what about this show? What about that show? But these are, I think, five critical shows um, that mark turning points in the business of television. And also, just to give you a little bit of uh, the behind the scenes of this, uh, Kenrick and I have developed a really nice dialogue over the last couple of weeks since I, I was um, uh, very graciously invited to do his podcast. And when we started talking about this, I had Kenrick try to guess what the five shows are. And he did pretty well, but he hasn't been able to guess the fifth show and so we're, this is gonna be another education for him. And at the end, I'm gonna give him an opportunity to guess the fifth show. So with that, let me uh, take you into the history of TV uh, in five shows. And the first show actually may surprise you. Uh, hold on, let me get this right. Okay, here we go. The first show is Friends. And the reason I pick Friends is that Friends in many ways represents the end of, uh, of, of an era of television. Friends represents the old model of TV that had been in place for decades. Um, and it used to be that the TV industry looked like this. Hold on, let me get this right, hold on. Okay, this was the TV structure of the TV industry for decades. You had the networks uh, and then you had the studios which were separate. So the studios would produce the shows, sell them to the networks. The networks would make their money in advertising revenue. The studios would own the shows, sell them reruns, et cetera. And so think about all the shows over the years that you've loved. Uh, NYPD Blue was owned and produced by 20th Century Fox Television, and it aired on, N uh, on ABC. Cheers was a Paramount show that, that aired on NBC. 
And this model has been in had been in place for decades. And it was really created by what was called the FinCEN rules, which was short for the Financial in Interest Syndication Rules, which were uh, launched, I think, around 1948. And the rules uh, said that a net networks could not own their own shows. And that's because it was an era back then, and, and Fox wasn't even around at that point. Fox was born in the mid 80s, but you had three networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, and that was it. And if you think about, uh, for you know, depending on what your demographic is, there are many of us who grew up um, and most of your big American cities had four stations. You had your ABC affiliate, like take Buffalo. Buffalo had Channel 2, and, and which was NBC, Channel 4, which was CBS, Channel 7, which was ABC, and Channel 29, UHF. It was an independent station. And Canada had its own version of that. There was really just the CBC and the CTV and maybe CHCH Channel 11 in Hamilton, an independent station. You know, Global didn't come around, I think, in, until, the, until the early 70s. So the rules in the, the US were networks and studios separate to allow for more voices and that networks were not allowed to monopolize um, the, the airwaves. And so what that gave you was a model of TV. Hold on, let me get to, okay, let me just get this right. Okay, so this was what Friends, um, a, a typical show looked like. Friends represented this model for decades. And so you had your network, which was NBC, and the show was owned and produced by Warner Brothers. And as you can see from my very fancy uh, graphics here, uh, the studio, the network would pay a license fee to Warner Brothers and it, the show, they would get two airings a year. And we, you know, we all grew up with uh, an original episode in the fall and then a rerun in the, in the spring and the summer. Uh, and then NBC would make its money from advertising and then uh, Warner Brothers would then t own the show and sell it in three runs in, in, in foreign. And as many of you know, Friends has been a monster hit. It th the show has generated probably billions of dollars. And the creators of the show, uh, through their deals, have a piece of the show and they've done just fine. Thank you very much. But this was the model um, that was in place for, for, for decades. And then, of course, you had all sorts of um, activity with the mergers, the, the first the repeal of the FinCEN rules, which allowed networks to own studios. And then you had a, a, whole, a whole spate of mergers and that, that has continued. I'm gonna talk about that later on and how, and how it's changed things. But this was the model that, that was in place for years. Um, and you know, it's interesting that um, you know, Friends, I think is the last monster hit. You, arguably you could say, well, that continue with Modern Family which was owned by ABC, I'm sorry, owned by 20th Century Fox and air on ABC or This Is Us. But those shows as well as they did never had these kinds of numbers, both in terms of viewership and also profits. Those shows are gonna do just fine. But the, the, Friends was the, the really the last of, of, of the huge monster hits. Okay, so let me continue on here. So, okay, hold on. Okay, so Friends show number one, marks the end of the old model of television. Then the second show, again, all opinion, which I think was a key inflection point, is The Sopranos. The Sopranos launched in 1999. It wasn't the first um, uh, a, a big hit on, ca uh, on cable. I'm sorry, let me, it wasn't the first success on cable, but it was the first monster hit on cable. Um, the Sopranos arguably put uh, HBO on the map. And it was groundbreaking in a few different ways. First of all, creatively, it introduced this concept of the anti-hero. Tony Soprano was a mafia don. I, I, anyone who heard the podcast heard me reference one of the classic episodes of The Sopranos, which I think is one of the classic episodes of television of all time, where uh, in season one, Tony Soprano takes his daughter Meadow on uh, a tour of colleges. And while they're on the tour, they see uh, he, he stumbles upon somebody in the witness protection program and kills him. Okay, that is, those things were never done. They were never done on network television in particular because network television, you know, the great phrase I've heard about CBS, for example, is they want their heroes heroic. So Tony Soprano was a, the first real anti-hero and he begat Walter White uh, on Breaking Bad or Vic Mackey in, um, in, in The Shield. So creatively, a groundbreaking show. Also, it was on cable. It wasn't network. You know, to this point, most of your colossal hits like Friends, Seinfeld, Cheers, NYPD Blue, et cetera, going all the way back to MASH and I Love Lucy were network shows. All of a sudden, this whole new uh, medium of cable uh, started, got a foothold. But also another thing that changed was the way the show was viewed. You know, as I said, with Friends and all the network shows that many of us grew up with, 
you'd have one episode air in the fall or winter and then a rerun in the spring and the summer. All of a sudden, if you miss The Sopranos on Sunday, HBO would rerun it on Wednesday or Thursday. You could watch it at any time. That was a, a big change. And then the last big change that uh, The Sopra Sopranos ha helped spawn was this idea of paying for television. You have to pay for HBO. So everything had been free until this point, and now you were being asked to pull out, you know, shell out 15 bucks a month so that you could watch The Sopranos. And of course, the, along with The Sopranos, there was Sex in the City and, and a few other shows, but it was really The Sopranos that uh, conditioned the world to paying for television and watching it somewhat differently. Okay, that is show number two. And then in show, uh, along comes show number three, which is House of Cards. I think that when the history of television is, is written, House of Cards is going to go down as a monumental uh, change to, to the industry. First of all, House of Cards was, um, was launched on a uh, network called Netflix that no one really had ever heard of. Netflix was sort of as renting DVDs and then mailing them back. And then Ted Sarandos and Reed Hastings were smart enough to see what the future was going to look like. They got into, stre into streaming. And what's interesting about uh, House of Cards is the way it was, it was um, birthed. And I hope I get this right. Uh, please don't quote me on it. But from all accounts, what happened was David Fincher and Kevin Spacey, it was an adaptation of a, of a British series. They went into uh, Netflix to pitch it. Uh, and what they were expecting is what, is that what any crea show creator expects is great. Uh, go ahead and make a pilot. Instead, they were told, here's X million dollars go give us 13 episodes. In fact, I think they, they ordered 26 episodes. And then in 2013, I think it was in the fall of 20, maybe in the winter of 2013, Netflix did something that no one had ever done before. They dropped all the episodes at once. And so people were now watching the entire season of the show over a weekend. And so the upshot is that House of Cards has effectively created binge watching. Binge watching has not been a, a, around that long. And, but it has completely shifted the way people watch televisions. It, it, watch, tel, watch television shows. I, I, you know, it's interesting, we just all watch the Super Bowl together, but beyond the Super Bowl, I, I, it, it, I wonder how many of us sit on a couch on a Wednesday night at eight o'clock and sit there and watch an hour of television sitting there watching all the commercials. It was really, House of Cards just was a, was a behavioral change uh, of mega proportions. Okay, that is show number three. And then along comes show number four, which is Game of Thrones. And the reason I put up Game of Thrones is somewhat similar to why I, I, I included Friends, which is Game of Thrones marked the end of a, an era. It, in my opinion, Game of Thrones marked the end of communal viewing. That point I made just a moment ago about all of us sitting on a couch at the same, watching a show at the same time, start to finish, I think ended with Game of Thrones. I think back to that series finale where the, the numbers of watching it live at the time were, were just through the roof. And even on a personal level, my wife happened to be uh, in Poland at the time. She was on the March of the Living. She, she was in uh, Warsaw. And uh, I had to ask her permission if I could watch the, the finale. Well, she was actually able to watch it while she was in Warsaw. So you had everybody all over the world watching the, this, this uh, epic uh, finale to, to this epic series. And what has happened since Game of Thrones, it really began with House of Cards and then Game of Thrones, I think, um, uh, also was it, helped shift that, which is that television no longer became a communal viewing experience. Television has effectively become the public library. You watch what you want, when you want, and how you want. You know, if, if you think about the library, you read the new John Grisham novel, you like it, you put it back on the shelf. You, you say, you know what, I want to read that John Grisham novel from a couple of years ago, or maybe you're going to watch, read something different, the Michael Connelly novel that's out, or you go back and you watch To Kill a Mockingbird, or re, read To Kill a Mockingbird. That is effectively how we are all watching television. Uh, during COVID, I'm watching new shows. I'm re-watching West Wing with, uh, with one of my daughters. And, and a byproduct of that is that the number of shows now, no surprise to anyone on this, the number of shows out there is absolutely staggering. It is overwhelming. When I was running the right stuff, I hired this one writer uh, who had worked on a, a series that I had never heard of. The series had been on the air for three years. There were 200 people who worked on that series. There were executives, marketing executives, and sales executives at the network that were promoting that series. 
I had never heard of it. I read articles in Variety or Deadline Hollywood announcing that show X is going to end its run over five, after five years. And I've never heard of it. And I'm an industry insider. It is, it is overwhelming trying to keep up with, with the show, with, with, with what's on TV now. I, I called it, I coined this phrase uh, a couple, um, uh, a couple uh, years ago, uh, DVR anxiety. I would, I would record 10, uh, all 10 episodes of, of a new series. And then I would get around to watching it and I said, I, I can't do it. And I would just delete it. It's just the number of shows is completely staggering. Okay, so Kenrick, this is your cue now. So Kenrick, um, I'm now going to, uh, hold on. So I wanna to get to show number five. And before I do, I wanna see if, if you have any guess of what this fifth show, again, it's an inflection point and it represents, I think, um, the reason I, I've selected this show is I think it represents the culmination of all of these changes. So I'm gonna give you one last shot at guessing what show number five is. Thank you for the opportunity to embarrass myself in front of everybody. For, for context, I thought I had the answer. Um, Hello Sunshine, that's Reese Witherspoon's company, sold for 900 million bucks. So I thought it was the morning show. It was kind of a confluence of a, a bunch of different things. Wrong. I thought it was succession. Took another L on that one. Um, I don't know, man. I'm Ted Lasso? I have no idea. Okay. It, that is a good guess. Um, but you're... you're, you're... You're thinking in the right direction. And uh, the only thing I would say is that there are probably, you're probably thinking about four of the key factors when there are probably seven key factors. And then there's one in particular. And so the show, drum roll please, which I think is, is the, the, the next big inflection point is the Mandalorian. <sighs> the Mandalorian it, it, to me represents, is the, is the full expression of what te the television industry has become. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the show, um, it is, you can tell maybe from the graphic, it is based on one of the, you know, an obscure uh, Star Wars character. First of all, the show is fantastic. It, it, it's really well done, but every single thing about the show speaks to the, 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 the state of the industry. It's on Disney Plus. Okay, so right there, Disney, the biggest entertainment company, has launched a streaming service. They're putting all their marbles uh, on that streaming service. They're cannibalizing ABC. They're cannibalizing Lifetime. You know, it's interesting, a, a, a Disney owns ESPN. About 15 years ago, uh, Disney was under enormous pressure to spin off ESPN because ESPN was so profitable that the, uh, that the, the investment community thought that, it was, that uh, the rest of the company was dragging down ESPN. Well, now that it's been flopped, they want, the investment community wants Disney to uh, spin off ESPN because it's a drag. Because you know, younger generations not watching uh, sports are not watching um, uh, Sports Center and the like. But Disney is now, so that's number one. Disney is, has a streaming service. Number two, it is based on IP. Everybody now wants intellectual property. And there is no bigger intellectual property than Star Wars to the point that Disney spent a bazillion dollars to buy it from George Lucas. And they are, they, they are taking this thing and they are milking it if, from a business perspective in the best possible way. And so you have... Disney Plus, you have a huge piece of IP. And then on top of that, you have another element uh, which has changed, which is this show was actually developed and led by Jon Favreau, uh, the actor director. Jon Favreau uh, did the Iron Man movies. He is an A-list director. And so one of the new themes is that in, this, uh, in these streaming wars, because these streaming companies are all competing or eyeballs are all trying to get you to, to cough up whatever $15 a month or $10 a month, but it's become an arms race. And so to cut through the clutter, uh, all of a sudden they want uh, these big names attached, but they don't want to pay them. So, but, so John Favreau is an A-list director. You put him together with a piece of IP, uh, a, a great piece of IP, and you, have, you put him on Disney+, Plus, and this is the future of television. And I would say kind of secondarily, is if, I, I, if you were to talk to the strategic planning people or Bob Chapek, the new CEO of Disney, I, my guess is he would prefer The Mandalorian to, any, like, um, to anything that would include a movie star because you don't have to pay whoever's in this show a big fancy, uh, you don't have to give them a, 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 any profit participation. Uh, you, know, you, you get to own everything. And that's why you're seeing Disney Plus uh, really focus on the, the Marvel franchise. They've done an incredible job with that. You know, Warner Brothers, uh, which uh, Time Warner, which owns uh, HBO Max, 
is now doing its kind its thing with um, with uh, uh, some of the I guess they're DC. Uh, they're all trying to emulate the the Disney model, and so a lot of these companies now are going through all their libraries to see what they have and what they. Uh, a great a great example is Peacock, which is uh, the Comcast slash NBC Universal streaming service, is launching. You, you may have seen the ads during the Super Bowl. They're doing a reboot, a Fresh Prince of Bel Air called Bel Air. And that is the the future. It, uh, the, the, these streaming services would prefer you come in with some piece of IP, established IP, rather than, hey, here's my original idea called Kenrick, the, the finance guy. Um, okay, so, uh, so this is, uh, you know, this is, these are the, the five shows. And as I said, um, you know, the TV business is now looking very different. This, you know, we've gone from, hold on, we went from this, which was in place uh, really until the 90s, to this, where you have these colossus, these colossal companies and the, one of the key things is that they all want to own everything. Um, and so it's, you get these situations where uh, you, know, you, you have to think about whether you want to bring your project to a studio uh, that is not affiliated with a network. So for, for example, if I have a perfect idea that I think would gr be great for, for say, uh, Disney, do I want to bring it to Universal? Uh, because no, because Disney doesn't want to buy from Universal. They want to own it themselves. Uh, they want to own it. They want to promote it. They don't want to pay for it, etc. That is what it, the world has become. And so it brings me back to, hold on, this, whoops, this quote here that I uh, mentioned at the top, which is Disney wants to see a few weeks of data before deciding on a pickup. This was uh, in reference to the right stuff uh, that, that I was working on for, for season two. And just the, 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 the wording of this, it's not they want to see ratings, they want to see data. The change in the language itself is a, is a sea change. And you know, if you compare it to um, network television, which had been uh, you know, paramount for years, you know, the networks would run shows into the ground as long as it would get a number. Well, now they're looking, you're, you're, they're looking at algorithms, they're looking at all these other factors. And so the upshot of this is that, here we go, whoops, I missed, there we go. Our show is canceled. Disney ended up not picking up the show uh, for a second season. A lot of it had to do, there, there, there were a variety of factors at work, but one of the big factors at play here was that we were a Warner Brothers show, an unbranded Warner Brothers show. And, and by that, I mean Disney Plus uh, very quickly became known for Marvel, for Star Wars, for Disney Kids. Uh, the right stuff didn't really have a brand and it was an adult entertainment show on a network which is actually skew younger and so as the uh, you know it, it's a way of showing you that i am living this uh, sort of boots on the ground all these changes in, in real time and in a very uh, fundamental way so let me just uh, talk a little bit about what what does this all mean so there's the thirty thousand foot view for for your purposes like the the investor purposes so for example the with the push to streaming one of the changes is that Everything is about new. These streaming services are subscription-driven services, which means they need new product to keep getting people to open up their wallets and, and pay, as opposed to a network which you know didn't charge anything. It was just commercials. And so one of the sea changes you're seeing is that you know ABC would a show like According to Jim, which was the Jim Belushi sitcom that was on for years. That thing ran for eight years, and they ran it for eight years because it still got a number. It, people still tuned in to see it, which means ABC could still sell commercials. Well, what's happening in the streaming world is that the, the models are showing that they don't need more than four seasons of a show. So prime example is a few years ago, Netflix did a reboot of the series One Day at a Time. Uh, and it was actually a very successful series for them. And then Netflix canceled it after four episodes. And they said publicly, we don't need more than four, uh, I'm sorry, uh, after four seasons, we don't need more than four seasons of a series. So that is a, a, a sea change. You're not going to have a hundred episodes or 200 episodes of, of your beloved shows, like, like Cheers or Friends. Those days are, are over. Another key change uh, from the 30,000 foot uh, level is this incessant demand for IP. Uh, it's getting harder to sell, to go with an original idea. They, you need want to have a book. You want to have a magazine article. 
even if you have like somebody's life rights, it helps. But the, the higher profile, the IP, the better. And to, to Kenrick's point, it's one of the, the reasons that Hello Sunshine, um, Reese Witherspoon's company, has been so successful because they've identified books and been buying book properties. And you know, you, you get a book, you team it with Reese Witherspoon and some high profile director, you can walk into any streamer and, and they'll, they'll want to buy it from you. And then another key change from the 30,000 foot uh, view is really there is no more what's called back end, which is no more, there are no more profits. Um, you know, the days of, of Friends or CSI becoming these colossal hits that line the pockets of the studios that, that the, the creators have a piece of, th those days are over. The way the, the um, license fees are being negotiated now, it's really cost plus a premium. So if your budget is $3 million an episode, they'll give you $3 million and like a 10 or a 50% on top of that. And, they, and Netflix or Amazon, they own it. That's it. There's no more selling because again, there's, there's no such thing as reruns anymore. It's the public library. These things sit, sit on a shelf for, forever. And so then the next question is going from like 30,000 feet, how does it affect somebody like me? You know, boots on the ground, a creative trying to, to uh, sell shows and, and make a living. And one of the paradoxes is that there is more programming than ever, but it is actually becoming harder to sell a show. Um, again, back to what I said a moment ago about it's become an arms race. And so they're all trying to beat up on each other. They're all trying to get you to open up your wallet and pay $15 a, a month. How are you going to do that? What can I do to cut through the clutter? And so it used to be somebody with my credits, maybe five years ago, uh, I could walk, if I had enough of an idea, an original idea, I could get in the door uh, and, and pitch my idea, probably get a, a pilot order, wouldn't necessarily get ordered to series, but at least I could sell a, a pilot, write the pilot, hopefully gets uh, ordered and shot maybe, and if I'm really lucky, it, it goes to series. If I'm even um, luckier than that, it, it, it stays on the air. But now just to get in the door, you got to come in with that piece of IP and hopefully a star and maybe a director. And what that means is that the TV business has effectively become the movie business. That's the way movies are sold. You go in, I have this director, this star, this book, but that is what's happening with the television business. And uh, I, it's funny, I have two projects um, that have um, stars attached. And with one of them, I can't even, we can't even set up meetings to try to sell it until he is available. So I'm sitting and waiting just for his schedule to open up just so we can go meet. A few years ago, I could have just gone in and pitched that. But now because the real sell selling point is going to be the star who's attached to, to my project, uh, I have to wait for him to be available. And even then, there's no guarantee that, that it's e even going to sell. Another change uh, that ha has happened uh, because of all this is that there are, there's really no more urgency. Um, and there are just these long periods of waiting for all of the challenges that network TV faces. And by network TV, I mean your, uh, broadcast, your conventional broadcast networks, your, your legacy networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox. And it also applies to say global and CTV is they can't be dark. ABC can't be dark at Tuesday night at eight o'clock. They need a new episode of whatever show of Fresh Off the Boat or, or, or Blackish. And so the entire television calendar is driven by that. The, the way shows are sold, the way shows are developed, that's all driven by ABC cannot be dark at Tuesday night at eight o'clock. They need a new episode. Well, in streaming, you don't have that urgency. Netflix can drop the next season of Stranger Things whenever they want. And so everything now takes forever. Deals take forever. Uh, you know, it, it could, I, I have a friend who just finished running a Netflix show. He finished, I think, in uh, October. He said Netflix told him they're not going to be dropping the show until June. And so he's sitting and twiddling his thumbs. And then, you know, the writers are all on options. Uh, they can't do anything until Netflix decides whether they want to pick them up or not. That's another change. Um, then you, it, it actually affects uh, the, everybody's, like the, both the macroeconomic picture I discussed earlier about no back end, the way uh, compensation for um, license fees work now, but it also affects the way people make a living. The arithmetic is very simple. Friends, Seinfeld, CSI, <coughs> that's my dog Gordy, sorry. 22 episodes a year. Well, most streaming shows are eight to 10 episodes a year. And as I said, you know, some of these have really long lag times. You could wait 18 months before your show drops. And so you have to be nimble and agile 
about how you make a living. You may be on the series, uh, uh, the staff of a show, but you may also have to, uh, you know, try and write a pilot, sell a movie, etc. And then there's one other factor. So I actually have a prop to show, which is uh, I hope people can see, hold on. Let me see. Uh, okay, this. Okay, uh, it's uh, there. We go. This uh, envelope is called a greenie. This is uh, the envelope in which the Writers Guild of America uh, mails residual checks. And residual checks, uh, the way it works is you write an episode of television. So I write an episode of The Good Wife. And every time it reruns, the Writers Guild uh, collects a residual check from, uh, from the studio. In, in this case, it was CBS Studios. Uh, residuals are all negotiated by the uh, Writers Guild uh, and the, the studios. It's all part of the collective bargaining agreement. There is a, a, a schedule, uh, a sliding scale of how uh, residuals are paid. Um, but um, uh, residuals for many writers, especially in periods where they're not working, become their main source, of, main source of, of income. And in fact, in the Dick household, we have a rule that my wife is not allowed to open the greenies because when she opens them, they tend to be a little bit smaller. When I open them, they tend to be a little bit larger. And in fact, the most common phrase spoken in my family is not, I love you. Uh, it's not, how was your day? It's any greenies when, when the mail shows up. Um, and so we've all gotten used to this. My kids even look for them. But the reason I mention all this is that the greenies are becoming extinct because as I said earlier, there's no such thing as reruns anymore. So th th what happens now is that you get the, if you write for a streaming show, you get this one-time payout uh, for your residual and that's it. The days of a, 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 of, of a hit show selling overseas and showing it, 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 selling into it cycle, different cycles of reruns, Friends is prime example. Again, those days are over. So that affects how people are going to make a living, particularly younger uh, and junior writers who are just starting out. Uh, and then finally, you have some non financial and qualitative consequences. Um, uh, you know, for example, uh, what's happening now with, with streaming shows, on a network TV show, it would go like this. Um, not, not Good Wife or House would be, would be renewed. We'd go to work in June, starting to break our episodes and write our episodes. Um, the show would start filming in July and we wouldn't stop until we wrapped uh, in early April. And the way it works in broadcast TV is once the train is moving, it does not stop. So when episode seven finishes shooting on a Tuesday, episode eight starts filming on the Wednesday. And so the machinery just keeps going and going and everybody is, is there until, uh, until the very end. Well, what's happening in streaming is that the, the way shows are, are staffing and operating is very different. The shows will typically have about a 25 week period where all the writer, a show will get ordered, uh, the showrunner will go and hire a, a staff, and for 25 weeks, the the the, the staff will break the episode. Break is the is the term of art for um, outline, coming up with a story and outlining it. You do it as a group for br breaking episodes and writing episodes. At the end of that 25 weeks, most of the writers, thanks for playing, you're done. The showrunner may stay on board with one or two senior people to see it through production, and uh, and that has a, a few uh, consequences. First of all, um, those junior writers are no longer getting production experience. It actually is, a, you have to be on a set to learn what it's like to, when an actor says, I don't want to say this line, or a director says, I can't quite make this work. Can, is there anything we can do differently? Or you're, at, you're running out of time, you have to shortchange a scene. Is there any way you can rewrite on the fly? That is a skill set to develop. They're also not, younger writers are also not getting the chance to participate in post-production, to sit in on editing and music scoring. So what it means is you're, you're actually no, no longer developing a bench of experience. And so when these junior writers uh, eventually graduate and become creators of shows themselves, they're not gonna have the experience of standing on a set or what it's, what it's like to, uh, to rewrite a script for production if you can't get a, a location or something. Um, and then the other thing, the last thing is that, that you get to miss is um, adjusting things that you discover, adjusting for things you discover on the fly. So I always give this example of Michael J. Fox, who guest starred, who guest starred in The Good Wife. Um, he came on for uh, an episode where he played the, the opposing lawyer. He did such a spectacular job and the cast just loved working with him so much that we kept bringing him back to the point that I think it was in season five, he became the big bad. 
he was the, the big antagonist for season five. We had him for most of the season and it was just, it was just a great experience, but that's something we discovered along the way. Um, and we adjusted uh, and, and for it. In streaming, you can't do that because you, once you write those 10 episodes or eight episodes and you start production, you're pretty much locked in. There's no discovering that that guest star who's starring in episode five, uh, you know, whether maybe if it's a show about witches, that new witch, that sh that's a great character. Maybe we can find a way to stick her in episodes six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, because you're kind of locked in at that point. So it is a variety of, 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 of both quantitative and qualitative changes. And we are all very much living uh, in a new world order, uh, trying to navigate the landscape. So Kenrick, I will stop there. Um, I've uh, ra ra rambled on and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. Thank you so much, Leonard. That was very informative. Um, we're gonna try, again, bear with us. We're gonna try uh, to see if there's any questions from the audience. Um, if you raise your hand, I think that's the best way to do it. We'll also, um, we'll also take a look at uh, any questions in the chat. So I wanted to start off with a question. Um, obviously a lot of investors on the call, we had a bit of a conversation about this when it comes to streaming services. So you've got the Netflix, you've got Disney, you've got Amazon. And I, I loved your quote that, you know, the most powerful person in entertainment could be a kid with a smartphone. So can you talk about the economics, big getting bigger, rich getting richer, or is there room for small upstart companies in this environment? That is a great question. And sadly, I think, um, the answer is, to your question is no, there is no more room for, for the small person. The, 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 the big companies want to own everything soup to nuts. And that's why The Mandalorian is such a compelling example uh, of where the industry is heading. And, you know, it, 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 one, of the, one of the great success stories in, in, in the history of television was Carsey Warner. Carsey Warner created Roseanne and, and Grace Under Fire and Third Rock from the Sun. Um, and, and actually the Cosby show, if we're still allowed to, to cite that, um, which was a, just a colossal hit. And they were an independent company and they were a very talent friendly company. And they, they, they found all these uh, comedians and the like and built shows around them. And they were uh, just, uh, just a, a terrific success story. A similar example was Seinfeld. Seinfeld came out of Castle Rock Television. That's Rob Reiner's company and Alan Horn's company. At the time they, they, you know, they were a movie company. They launched a little TV division and came up with a show with, with, this, uh, with this comedian who sort of had a profile and uh, it, was, uh, it was a success. There are no more Castle Rocks. There are no more Carsey Werners. And the, the, I think the first change started, you saw it in, in network a little bit, which was, you, know, it, you saw it I think with CBS, um, which CBS in many ways represents the, the model of, the, of the, um, the legacy TV company. It's interesting, CBS is still in 2022 programming mostly what are called procedurals, closed in your cop shows, your legal shows, your medical shows, and it's skewing very much to, to, towards an, an older audience. But what started to happen in the wake of these mergers is that um, you know, CBS, if you, wanted to, if you were Warner Brothers and you had a show you want to sell to CBS, CBS would say, CBS would say great, we're going to take 50% of the, sh of the show. And so sometimes you, like, ha what, what could kill a show potentially is that Warner Brothers and CBS couldn't negotiate a co-ownership of it. So the big companies want to control everything. So if a Carsey Warner today wants to get in the door, they are, what they have to do is they have to go to Netflix directly and, you know, Net, and Netflix is say, okay, great, we're gonna own it. And you know, we'll give you a little piece of something, but you're not getting what you had with Seinfeld. You're not getting what you had with Cosby or, or Roseanne. And, and sadly, the, the big, that's why I think this, this Disney Fox merger uh, is, is such a watershed event. The, it, it went from gigantic to, I don't know, what, what, colossal. To, it, it, and th this is what you're dealing with, with these companies. These companies are absolutely enormous now. And they don't want to give anything away to any little person or a little company. Makes sense. So I've got a bunch of really good questions in the chat. So let me bang a few of those off. So this is very interesting. Would the sixth show to make your list and, and change TV, would it be um, a show that was able to successfully monetize by linking directly to the blockchain and charging viewers, thereby bypassing all the streaming platforms? That, that's a great question. That's a really smart question. You know, it, it's interesting. I'm gonna spin, the, spin 45 degrees and, and given a, by, by setting another example, 
YouTube television try has tried to, I don't know if you call it bypass or create an alternate way in. And they've had mixed success. You know, the show Cobra Kai actually launched on, on YouTube and then YouTube walked away from it and it went to Netflix and become a, a, a big hit. And so one of the, the, the takeaways I think in the current environment is that to some extent, the more familiar outlets are still the, are still the ones drawing the eyeballs, whether they're paying or not paying. And so finding that unconventional, unorthodox way in, it, it's smart thinking, but it might be five to 10 years away. I mean, one of the things I, I actually said this, uh, Kenrick, when we did the podcast together is the, the entertainment industry, the media business is very slow to adapt. It doesn't adapt, it sues. So it, it, it takes them a long time to, to, to catch up. And this has been true everything from the advent of television to DVDs to MP3 to, to, to streaming. And so that model that that you're that whoever asked the question that's it's really right. that might happen, but it ain't going to happen. I don't think for another five five to ten years. If there is a six show, um, which I think is a great question, I think um, that th this a, a good example of the six show would be either Lupin or better yet Squid Game because. Squid Game is the was the number one show in the world. Some astronomical, I think it was like 90 million people had seen Squid Game. A, a show out of Korea that nobody had ever heard of. You know, it's interesting. Shows, international shows, foreign language shows don't have, you know, never sold here. All of a sudden, and maybe it's because of, we're all at home because of, because of COVID, we're all watching shows. When I think about my COVID viewing, most of my COVID viewing has been lighter shows. I just watch shows that go down easy. I, I can't have dark. Like I've been watching Cobra Kai and Only Murders in the Building. But the other, the other half of the shows I'm watching include Call My Agent out of France, Money Heist out of Spain, Squid Game. I'm actually watching a couple of shows, um, a, a couple of shows uh, out of other parts of Europe. In fact, one of the things I'm doing now um, is I'm actually consulting on two shows for Netflix International, one out of Netflix Spain, one out of Netflix Poland. Um, they, I'm working with the, the, the creators of the show and it's been a great experience, but that like all of a sudden the international marketplace has opened up to the sense there are no more borders. Like where a show originates doesn't matter anymore. And that could be, so that's why a show like Lupin could be the example of the sixth show for now. That's interesting. And then the that was, that was, that was yeah, that was another question because I mean, there's Money Heist. You mentioned a bunch of the Money Heist, uh, Squid Games, uh, Lupin, All of Us Are Dead, another Korean show. And, and another thing and, that's great about that, and I'll mention that, is the, 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 the process of developing shows overseas is very different from, from the process here in the US. You know, you, you probably heard or seen it like on a show like 30 Rock, how we all go through these layers of notes. Like, I'll, I'll get on a notes call with the network. There are 12 people on the call, there are three executives from the network three executives from the studio, if there's a production company, you know, two or three, and everybody's got an opinion. And so you get, you just get noted to death um, and it can really suck the life out of a project. Um, and I, I don't think it happens that way in the European markets. You know, they, they don't, they don't go through this development process the way uh, our, our, our series do. And so you get very much a, a clarity of vision from whatever the creator uh, you know, envisions out of the starting gate. Okay, great. And another question out of the chat. If you were to read Hastings, what asset or company would you be looking to acquire right now? It's a great question. I, I think if you read Hastings, well, let me, let me spin the question. I think this is a war of attrition. And uh, again, one person's opinion, but I just look at, I just look at how what what I watch, what I what I subscribe to, and what I don't subscribe to, and what, how my kids are watching. So full disclosure, I just uh, I, I just my wife and I just watched the show Yellowstone, and uh, what we did was we watched it on Peacock, which is the uh, NBC Universal Comcast streaming service. We I, I was pushing it, Lisa. We got to watch it because the thirty month try the thirty day trial is going to end, right? So we, we were watching furiously because I didn't want to pay four ninety nine a month. So if you read Hastings, you don't necessarily have to buy anything. You just have to wait for some of these other ones to die off. Uh, however, if, the, 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 if you are read Hastings and you're going to buy, if you want the library, 
then you may want to pick off a the, the library that is most appealing to you. you. Reed Hastings probably can't afford Disney, but he might be able to afford Comcast Universal uh, or CBS Viacom. But really, if you're Reed Hastings, you're 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 buying what you're buying is is if you're buying CBS Viacom, uh, you're buying. Indiana Jones and Happy Days. You don't need the CBS network. You don't need the Paramount Plus network. You don't need the Paramount Plus streaming service. So is it worth the price? So that's why I, I, I really stick with my first answer. If you read Hastings, you, you, in my, again, one man's opinion, I think Netflix and Disney are really the, the iPad and everything else is the Microsoft Surface. And everyone else is playing catch up. Um, so if you read Hastings, maybe just stick around long enough and, and hope that these other companies um, uh, uh, struggle. I mean, it, the, the one question, the one company I think that'll be interesting to watch is Apple because Apple doesn't have the library that these other companies have. And, you know, Apple to its credit, I mean, they've launched, uh, full disclosure, I worked on uh, an Apple series, uh, Truth Be Told, but they're doing very star driven uh, projects. Um, and so far that they've enjoyed some success, but long term, uh, it, it becomes a question of how valuable. Uh, is the company without a library, but maybe their business model might be different from, from Netflix. So what about network TV? If, if they, is it possible that network TV can still be competitive and just remain dependent on ad dollars or do they all have to have some sort of streaming service to really survive? Uh, I think we're seeing a version of the, the second point you described. Let, let, me, let me go over the two points in reverse. Um, I was talking to an executive, uh, a guy I'm friendly with, who, who actually was an executive um, at uh, 20th Century Fox Television. He ended up uh, in the restructuring, uh, losing his job. But what he, he had a really cool insight into network TV. He said, they've become promotional platforms for streaming. So take a show like Big Sky, which is on ABC. Um, it's from David E. Kelly. I think the show's done well. It's really a way to promote the show so that you go and watch it on Hulu, which Disney also owns. And so um, it's interesting, the, sh the series FX, the, I'm sorry, the, the cable channel FX had this promotional campaign called FX on Hulu. So here's our show. It's going to air at Wednesday at eight o'clock. And if you miss it, that's okay. You no longer have to wait for the spring for a rerun. And you don't even have to watch on abc.com. Go, go to Hulu where you have to pay whatever, $4.99 or, or $9.99 a month. Um, and so that, so, so for, for scripted shows, that seems to be the, the, the vector that, that, the, the, that network TV is, is following, following. Because if you look at the rate, just the pure old school rate, old, old line ratings of the shows, network TV shows are launching, like, a couple of shows I know recently just launched with 0.5 ratings. That, that, that number would have gotten you canceled by the first commercial break two or three years ago. And even your successful shows are pulling in these minuscule ratings. Then you have your big, big events. For example, the Super Bowl. It seems like the last, the last, kind, of pro, the last kind of programming that draws is, is sports and, and politics. And that's why I think Rupert Murdoch selling all of his assets, uh, his, his, his content assets, to Disney is a watershed moment. He kept the Fox network, he kept Fox News, and he kept the newspapers, but he got rid of the 20th Century Fox movie studio, the 20th Century Fox television studio, and he effectively got out of the content creation business. So one of the questions we're asking uh, in the creative community is, what is Fox? In fact, um, two, uh, I, I sold a pilot to Fox. I was, sold, I was with Warner Brothers. We sold, uh, it was original idea, uh, sold it uh, two years ago, and it was right after Fox sold all the assets to Disney. And, you know, it was this question of what is the Fox network? And I my, my pilot didn't get picked up. We got close, but we didn't get picked up. But I joked that that year, Al Jazeera ordered more drama pilots than Fox. Because Fox, you know, it's a question, are they going to still be in the script? They still have The Simpsons, which is a, still a success. They have Family Guy. But uh, they don't have American Idol anymore. I think that's moved over to, to ABC. So there's a question of what is Fox? And so, you know, they, they, I think they now have Thursday night, tel, uh, Thursday night football, which is uh, valuable, but are they still gonna be in the scripted business? So it's a, the first part of your question is a great question. What is network TV? Um, and is it still gonna be driven by ad dollars? I can't, t Sunday was the first time in I don't know how long that I sat on a couch and watched TV and sat there and, and watched commercials. 
So it, I, I think there are every strategic planning division of every major media company is wrestling with that question. Good answer. And any other questions from the line? Feel free to raise your hand and ask away. Otherwise, I'll, I'll keep rambling on as well. All right, we do I have, have a question. I have a question. Uh, could you uh, talk to, about where you see the future of uh, streaming when it comes to sports? I know Amazon is building a partnership with the NFL. Do you see that how that's an avenue for Prime to become one of the, those bigger players? I think the answer is yes. It, you know, the, the, the center of gravity has, has shifted to these big streaming companies. And they are, they, they are to use a, a, a business, they are all stealing market share. They're stealing, if you think back to what Fox did, God, it's gotta be almost 30 years ago. Um, Fox was an upstart network. They had a couple, they had The Simpsons and Mary with Children. And, and that was it. It was this long before American Idol. And it was still um, trying to get its footing. And then Rupert Murdoch spent a colossal amount of money. Just he outbid the, I think it was maybe CBS at the time, yeah. NBC, to buy the NFL. And that effectively put Fox on the map. And Fox, of course, we all know well, and uh, we, we identify it with, with football and even baseball. And I think we're seeing something similar with the streaming services. They are spending huge sums of money and they are trying to get a, 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 a uh, foothold in these different uh, different areas, and they're going to hold on to it. So I, I think that you're going to see more product on streaming. You know, part of it also is the younger generation. They don't even know what ABC or NBC are. You know, like I, I, I think uh, we're going to see the end of uh, once this is us uh, finishes its run. We may see the. I, I can't think of how what other successful shows there are that are non-cop shows on CBS, and so younger viewers immediately go to Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, et cetera. And so I would guess that for sports, that's going to be, if those are, that's where the eyeballs are, then that's where the sports is going to be. But again, it, it, it's all a guess, but I'm just looking at where the vectors are, are pointing. And it's, you know, again, Disney buying, Disney launching Disney Plus is, it, it, to me is kind of the bellwether uh, that we should all watch. That is where everything is heading. The future, the present is streaming and the future is going to be even more streaming. Quick one, right? Yeah, quick one. I mean, so you see in Apple uh, TV Plus, they have started advertising other shows or movies on their platform before you get to the show or movie that you want to watch. How long do you think it is going to take before these various platforms have all the eyeballs and revert back to advertising from the Fortune 500 companies that are willing to pay X million dollars for X number of seconds? Or do you think that somebody will really try and disrupt for in, a, in the fight for growth and eyeballs and lower the price and or make it free, but the catch is the ads are back? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, but the short answer is, I, I don't know. Like, if you look at Facebook as a model, once, you know, like, advertising was verboten on Facebook, then advertising became common on Facebook, and now everyone's tiring of Facebook, and in some ways it almost feels, you know, quote-unquote old. And um, it, it's interesting, your question's really interesting because there's the dynamic of people want to stream, but they don't want to pay. And so, but they also don't want to watch commercials. So, you know, the, my streaming service sub, subscriptions, I have the entry level uh, ones. I'm paying, I don't want to pay $9.99 for no commercials. I'll pay $4.99 and I'll watch commercials. It's, you know, I don't pay attention to them, but I will sit there and be delayed for two minutes uh, before, you know, Yellowstone comes back after it's, you know, it's com commercial break. And so I think it, it'll be a, a war between um, those who don't want to pay um, and those who are, are willing to pay. And if enough people start, you know, it, whatever the new version of cutting the cord is, if it, I guess it's subscription enders, if that's the case, maybe it forces Paramount Plus or Peacock to distinguish themselves by saying, hey, watch our streaming service. Uh, you don't have to subscribe. You just have to sit and watch some advertisers. So we're in the early stages of the, of the streamer wars. Uh, we, we have some late entries 
They are just trying to get their footing. They are all, they're all for the most part, with the exception of um, Apple, following similar strategies now with you know, mining their libraries for IP, um, you know, the, the different tiers of watching, whether you can cancel and not cancel. And so eventually, you know, I guess it's a, it's, it's a, in some ways it's a form of perfect competition back to our intro to economics class. But I, 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 at some point they're gonna have to start distinguishing themselves beyond just what's on the screen. And so maybe to your point, we do see someone say, let's just chuck the subscription uh, subscription charges and go with advertising, people will sit through it. But again, I don't know, uh, the, the change, I'm just trying to get my head around what's happening now, that it's hard to think, you know, five years, 10 years out. Thank you. Great, any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand and ask away. All right, let me, let me ask this one um, as, a, as a TV and streaming watcher. Some, so some, Subscription services have adopted the binge watching model where they drop all the episodes. But you know, HBO, Showtime, like Yellow Jackets, Game Thrones, they're still going with the once a week release. Why is that? Do you see you see that continuing? We it's so interesting you ask that because um, it actually affects us uh, on the creative side. You know, for example, when I was working on the Apple Show, uh, truth be told, we we were the first for a variety of reasons. We ended up being the first new Apple series. Uh, drama series to go into production. We weren't supposed to be. They had, um, there were some issues with a couple of their other series and they got delayed and we ended up be, being the first one. But we went into it um, not knowing what Apple planned to do, how they planned to drop it. Then we, what we were told was they were going to drop the first three episodes and then one, 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 one. And so what that meant was our first three episodes became a de facto three-parter. And so we had to uh, find a way to tell the story so that it would make you sit through and watch episodes one, two and three. So the question you're asking actually affects the way shows are being developed, the way stories are being developed and broken. But it, I think it goes to this idea of um, they all have their algorithms and they all have their models. And somebody is sitting in a room and determining that we should drop this two episodes, two episodes, and then one, 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 because they want to get you to continue your subscription. They don't want you doing what I'm doing with Yellowstone, which is trying to hurry up and watch all the episodes and end after the 30 day trial. I've done, I, I, we've done this multiple times. And, and obviously these executives are not, are not dumb. They're gonna, they, they figured out that that's what people are doing. They're trying to find a way. I, I think if they had their druthers, they would drop it the, the, the way network TV does, which is once a week. And maybe that's eventually the, the I mean, this is Ted Lasso, I think dropped I think they might have dropped two to start and then did one, 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 one because there was such a big demand for Ted Lasso. So it might, the, the answer may be, Kenrick, that it's, it might be um, sh show specific, you know, it, depending on how they, they generate interest and what they have, other shows that they want to promote while, before they, they launch that new episode. Um, it's a mystery. Nobody knows. And all of us on the, on the creative front lines are asking that question uh, every time we're, we're working on a project. How are you going to drop the show? And often the answer is, we don't know yet. So I think we're coming up on time, but maybe I'll ask this one last question um, more on the financial side. So I know we've talked all about um, all these massive subscriber numbers for Netflix and Disney Plus. It just seems like a bit of an incongruency. You've got all this demand for content, yet it seems like the big behemoths are keeping their costs in check. Do you think that's going to go, that's going to continue? Or do you think there's going to be cost inflation in terms of, they're just a, we just need to get these shows in and we'll pay whatever yeah. for it? Uh, I think that the, the, the costs are going to be continued, are going to continue to be contained. And the, re the simple reason, it's the law of supply and demand. There are just fewer places to go to. Uh, you know, first of all, you have um, just, there were going to be, what, four or five major streaming services, and that's it. You know, broadcast TV, cable, so, you know, there are going to be casualties. The, a lot of those entities that are, that are in the scripted world, uh, in scripted programming are just going to uh, tip over their king and say, we're, we're done. Um, and there's, there's just fewer places to go. Another, for, another factor is, and this is something you and I talked a little bit about, is the, the sort of end of the movie business as we know it, which is the, the movie business and, and COVID, this has been well documented, but COVID has definitely accelerated this. Um, the, the days of going to a movie theater are, are over. Like, the, the, the experience of West Side Story is so telling. It, it, it was a critical darling. 
a uh, Steven Spielberg directed movie. You cannot get a bigger name attached. And the movie um, did very poorly at the box office. And one of the big reasons is that it was targeting like 50 and 55 and over. And that audience was not going to the movie theater because of COVID. And it's a question of, are those, are those, is that audience going to come back? And another thing that happened during COVID that you all probably read about uh, or heard about was that Warner Brothers announced that all of their, uh, I think 2021 movies were gonna launch on HBO Max and out of the movie theaters. And this, I know you and I talked about, was it Black Widow in, uh, launching on Disney Plus rather than the theaters? And there was a whole controversy with Scarlett Johansson and her profit participation. Um, and so they don't want that. That's the thing, they don't wanna do that anymore. So, um, they, they don't want to have to pay out whatever $20 million in profit participation to Scarlett Johansson. Um, and they, 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 you know, so movies are gravitating towards television. It's easier now to get a star because she, he or she has, you know, they, they got to make a living. They have fewer uh, options to go. Like, there are fewer movies being made unless it's a Marvel movie. There are fewer star-driven movies being made. They're going to launch in the movie theater. So the, all the vectors, I think, are, are pointing in the right direction for these behemoths. And so with, with fewer places to go, with less demand, uh, I mean, in other words, less, fewer, fewer entities buying, I think they'll be able to control the cost. And that's why, you know, the, the days of, uh, you know, you don't want to pay me, well, we're going to walk it over to, uh, we're, you don't want to pay me Warner Brothers, we're going to walk it over to Paramount or NBC won't uh, pay up, well, we're going to take it over to, to, to CBS. There, there are just fewer places to go. They, they hold all the cards. Great. Well, maybe we'll end it on that. Um, thanks. I just want to thank everyone for participating. I especially want to thank Leonard for his insights. Uh, as always, great conversation and uh, lots of information to digest. So thank you.